Hi, everyone, and welcome to a special Center for Southeast Asian Studies event tonight. I am really happy to welcome you here to our University of Michigan Center of Southeast Asian Studies, where we have a special screening of A Village Called Versailles with a panel, um, a panel of people to talk about it after. Um, I'm Laura Rosick. I direct the Center for Southeast Asian Studies here, and I'm also an associate professor in environmental health. So this kind of combines our my my two fields of study here. So it's an especially fun night for me. Um, and part of this is uh, part of my class in the environment and human health. Um, so I want to give a special welcome to my students and thank them. This started as a small event for my class, and we all, as we started all talking about it, got excited and decide to invite our the wider community. So we're really happy to have everybody here tonight. Um, so tonight's event format, we'll have some announcements and introductions. Um, we will watch the film. I'll explain a little bit more explicitly how we'll do that, but you'll watch it on a separate browser um, just because of film rights and being attentive to um, watching a film that still is under rights and making sure that we're um, being respectful. And then we come back again at 8.10 to 8.30ish to reconvene on the Zoom webinar panel discussion and question and answer. And I wanted to welcome some of the um, students and potential students who are visiting from our department tonight and remind you that we will, um, Professor Lee and I will stay around after to talk to you if you have any questions about our department. I want to thank our co-sponsors, the um, Environmental Health Sciences at the University of Michigan in the School of Public Health, in which I'm an associate professor, um, the Department of Asian Languages and Cultures, and of course, our International Institute, um, in which CEASE is housed. And of course, we couldn't do any of our events without um, generous funding from the United States Department of Educational Na National Resource Center grant. So thank you to them for their continuing support. Um, just to continue our announcements quickly, if you haven't had enough of Southeast Asian studies, and I know I never do, um, tomorrow we have a really exciting talk at our normal lecture time, Empires of Vice, the Rise of Opium Prohibition Across Southeast Asia. And this is Diana Kim, who's an assistant professor from Georgetown, will give this talk. So please register and come if you are able. And rounding out our February events. And Friday, March 12th, um, Sylvia Nam, who is from the University of California, Irvine, will talk about making property out of air, experiments in urban form in Phnom Penh. And so, as I mentioned tonight, um, we're really excited to show a village called Versailles. Um, I wanted to welcome our CIS community, welcome any of our friends from Tulane who are visiting, um, and again, welcome our environmental health sciences community and also welcome our panel. And we're really excited to have some of our colleagues from Tulane here. And one of them is a University of Michigan School of Public Health alum, Mark Van Landingham, who is a Thomas J. Keller professor at Tulane University. He's going to be on our panel tonight. He teaches a few courses. I kind of want to take myself pretty quickly. Population Mobility and Health and Health Problems of Developing Societies. He teaches that with Catherine Adernopoulos. Um, Professor Van Landingham directs Tulane Centers for Studies of Displaced Populations. He leads research teams focusing on rural to urban migration within Southeast Asia, long-term post-disaster recovery and acculturation, health and well-being among the Vietnamese immigrants living in New Orleans. He has a recent book called Weathering Katrina and that focuses on the latter two topics. Cam Tam Tran is a 1.5 generation Vietnamese American. She immigrated with her family to Denver, Colorado in 1975. She was an elementary school teacher before she moved to New Orleans with her husband right after Hurricane Katrina to help rebuild the Vietnamese community. She is a uh, founding part of the founding members of the MQVN Community Development Corporation in New Orleans East at MQVN CDC. She was the project manager of Education and Cultural Center. She co-founded the Intercultural Charter School, which was approved by the Louisiana Department of Education in 2008. Cam is passionate about education and preserving the Vietnamese culture. She started collecting oral histories in 2008, and she hopes to open a cultural center one day. She's also actively involved in her Catholic church. 
She teaches religious education and the Vietnamese languages on weekend. She's also currently the assistant director at the Center for Studies of Displaced Populations at Tulane University School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine. And we're also excited to have her on the panel. And I did ask her and she is in the background of the movie. So if you spot her, um, you get a prize of seeing her. And we're also um, excited to have our newest professor in environmental health sciences moderate our panel tonight, Aurora Lee. Dr. Lee is an assistant professor in our Department of Environmental Health Sciences here at the University of Michigan. She has interdisciplinary research interests centered around highly infectious disease mitigation and management with a focus on training, education, prevention, and preparedness. We hired her before COVID was COVID, so we feel like we were a little ahead of the game here and we're thrilled to have her on faculty. Her experience in the area includes previously assessing the Nebraska Biocontainment Unit with their research and programmatic activities to during the 2014 to 2016 West Africa Ebola outbreak, serving as a subject matter expertise consultant for the National Disaster Medical System, and continuing as a subaward PI and trainer for the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences Worker Training Program. She is also interested in the intersections between health behavior, occupational therapy, and industrial hygiene, as well as psychosocial factors that influence occupational health. And again, we're happy to have her moderate our panel after the discussion tonight. All right. Hello again, everybody. I hope you've had the opportunity to watch through the documentary or most of the documentary. Um, we will now begin the question and answer section. Um, and we are still accepting your questions. So your mics are muted, but if you have a question, please navigate to the bottom of your Zoom screen with the Q&A icon. And when you submit your question in the Q&A, please include your name, an affiliation, um, and in addition to your question, so that can provide us some context. Um, so before I go ahead and kick off the panel, I just wanna say this documentary is always great when I watch it. Um, this isn't my first time and it really makes me proud to be a first generation Vietnamese American and just how resilient our community is. Um, so I just wanted to open up the panel first by asking Cam, as a member of the community, I didn't have enough of an eagle eye to spot you in the documentary, I'm sorry, but if you wouldn't mind sharing your personal experiences of, you know, the, being in the community, rebuilding after the hurricane, and trying to fight this landfill, and just sharing your personal experiences and the impact on the community. Thank you, Aurora. Um, you know, too bad you couldn't spot me. I was there two, two places, but that's all right. <laughs> you know, I was younger then too. Well, you know, this, I, I've watched this um, documentary, I don't know how many times, but every time, uh, you know, it just flood back all these memories. And, you know, and like you, I feel really proud every time I watch it, because, you know, uh, being Vietnamese, you, you see all the struggles that, you know, that especially our older generation has gone through and then the resilience and, you know, the, uh, and all that. So, but it really left an impression um, just to see the challenges that they have to go through. And I think because, you know, I'm outside of the community coming in. So, you know, so it was, it was, it was my first time being in a community that are so connected. You know, they have all this history and all this generation. Because you know, when I first came into the community, the first thing they asked me is, who's your grandparents? And then when I told them that I was not from this community, they was like, oh, really? You know, and, and you know, but, but that's how they connect, is they, they connect by asking who your grandparents are, and that's how they connect. And, but, you know, as, as, as I work within the community, because when I first came down, I was just volunteering. I was volunteering at the church, uh, you know, passing out uh, supplies, passing out food, filling out documentation and, you know, translating all that. Uh, and then when all this thing came up, uh, you know, cause it's, they're such a sweet community. You know, all the people there are so sweet. And, you know, and, and like Father Vien said, they never voice anything, you know, and they didn't have, they didn't have a reason to really until now. And then when that all that stuff happened, it was just more like, you know, trying to, 
And that's the, the powerful thing is seeing the elders working with the younger generation. Because, you know, as you see in the, the, in the movie, a lot of the, gener uh, the younger generation complained that they were not at the table because everything was made, the decision was made by the elders. And, and, you know, and, and that was so powerful to see that the younger generation stepped up and did the translation. And, and you know, because they knew the laws, they knew what, 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 that everything was, was wrong. While the, young, while the older generation, you know, they have gone through so much challenges but they're willing to do anything to fight for their community. So, you know, so all this kind of just brought like all the emotion when you're there. And, you know, and, and I had such a good connection with the elders because I worked so closely with el the elders in terms of all these different things I was doing with them. So it just, it kind of pained me to see some of the elders who have passed away and then I see them and I was like, oh gosh, I, I really miss them. And so it kind of like really just broke my heart to see that. But then I also see some of the younger generation, especially when they're, they're in high school and how successful they are now, you know? And then it just kind of touched me just to see the rebuilding process of the community and how it has connect the younger generation with the older generations. And, you know, and, um, and just seeing the rebuilding process, and uh, and where we are now, and you know, and, and you know, and, it's, and it doesn't end because we're constantly fighting something, you know, like with the BP oil spill, we were fighting that, and so now we're fighting the opening of a of, of an electric plant. So it's just a constant thing. So a lot of time, it, so watching this kind of connect me with what the black community is going through. It seems like the people of color are constantly fighting. We're, kind, we're constantly struggling. And, 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 you know, and I think we, during this time, we did work together a lot with the black community as well to, uh, you know, with all this. So, so I'm hoping that, you know, watching this can connect us to the other color community, people of color, how their struggles are. And we are also struggling and it's a constant battle. So it, it hasn't ended yet. Thank you for sharing that, Cam. Um, I, yeah, that especially resonated with me in the film and that always in solidarity with other our other communities of color is so crucial, especially during these times um, and the events of last year and even this year, now with the racism towards Asian Americans due to COVID-19. Um, I was hoping before we start on the Q&A, um, Dr. Van Landingham, if we could also get you, since you're from the New Orleans community as well, sharing your personal experiences and connection from an academic perspective. Yeah, I'd be happy to, thank you. Uh, I'll actually key off a couple of things that you and Cam um, said. You, you both made some really excellent comments that I really agree with. Um, Aurora, when you said your first reaction was that made you made you proud to be a Vietnamese American. Well, I'm not a Vietnamese American, obviously, but I am an American and I'm a, I'm a New Orleanian. And it made me proud too, you know, that um, this community had really rallied against um, such difficult um, circumstances. And at a time when everything was going badly for the, for, for the rest of us, the city government was failing us, our insurance companies were failing us, the state and federal government were failing us and the city was it just failing itself, you know, and um, not being able to rally to kind of move itself forward during this really difficult time. And, and um, it's really worried watching this saga play out in Eastern New Orleans. I've been involved as an outsider in that community for a long time, well before Katrina, and was very concerned about what was gonna to happen to um, people who I, I cared a lot about, people who I really admired. And things looked really, really, um, really, really terrible for them. I mean, I, I was quite confident that they were not going to survive as a community. and. A lot of the things that the Urban Land Institute was suggesting were not far-fetched. And I'd say that's kind of one disagreement I have with the movie is that the New Orleans is a, it was, was built on land to support about twice as many people as it has now, like all um, industrial cities, including Detroit. Uh, we've been shrinking very rapidly um, and from, from what we were. We were about 750,000 when the city was built, when Eastern New Orleans was built, and now we're about um, half, of, half of that now. And so this idea of 
for a very poor city to consolidate its resources and try to protect what you can protect and not have this really big footprint, you know, that you can't provide electrical services and fire and police and garbage, you know, over such a wide spread area. It wasn't surprising at all that they would, in fact, it's very logical for them to kind of figure out how, how can we kind of shrink the footprint <laughs> footprint and um, you know protect what we have also not surprising at all that they're going to pick on a marginalized group that had been very quiet had kept to themselves many of them didn't speak english they were very happy not to be involved in the um and new orleans you know political show and they thought that they, they could get away with it. and what's really remarkable is they didn't you know and, and a lot of things really had to go right for the Vietnamese community to avoid the fate of that, that landfill would have been the end of them. It was right next door and just connected to all their water sources in the community. And that struggle to keep the second generation folks from moving away in the first place because, you know, there are just lots of really good opportunities. Um, um, other places, they, they were kind of on their way to losing their kind of identity as its central identity as, as a you know, concentrated Vietnamese um, you know, community over, over time because as in all immigrant communities, second, second and third generation become kind of less Vietnamese, more Americanized, you know, less, um, you know, adept at, you know, the, the language and culture that binds them together. I totally agree with Vian, Father Vian, you know, in the movie when he said that, you know, all in all this, they actually did a lot of good things for the community. And I, I think that's true too. It brought in the youth, kind of gave them some investment in this, um, you know, social glue that had held the um, community together, you know, you know for, for so long. And also kind of provided a, a, a nice example for how a community could actually um, draw itself. And I don't want to kind of overstate the homogeneity of the community. I mean, there's Catholic, there's Buddhist, you know, there's, um, um, you know, people from you know, all different kind of walk, you know, walks of life that don't agree on, just, they just disagree on lots of stuff. It's not this kind of monolithic community, you know, but they really did provide an example of, you know, when faced with this common threat, they were able to marshal their resources, draw upon the central features that they do share as a community. And there's a lot of things that they, that they do share and uh, pull themselves together. And it's a real David and Goliath story. You know, they um, uh, forced the, the big um, entities of local, state, federal government, you know, to, to back down and, and do it an about face. So um, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Van Landingham. Uh, that's very insightful. And we do have uh, a flood of questions coming in, which is very exciting. So if those of you are patient enough to stay a little bit past 830, we'd like to get through as many as we can. So we have a question. Uh, apologies. Uh, I'm definitely going to say your name wrong, but I will try. It's Zohad Khan. He's an undergraduate senior or he or they, I'm sorry, an undergraduate senior at the University of Michigan. Was there any response or reaction from the Vietnamese government? Was there any communication between the Vietnamese and American governments on the situation post-Katrina impacts? I'll, I'll go first, Cam, if you don't mind. Quite a lot. Um, you know, the, there's some, you know, links still, after all this time, you know, some lingering hostility between the you know, the Vietnamese American, you know, community and the uh, official, you know, state, state government um, in Vietnam. It's also a fascination in, in, in both ways, you know, of, of Vietnamese Americans about, you know, what's going on in Vietnam and, and vice versa. So there was quite a lot of, uh, of interest in Vietnam to, um, about Katrina all over the world. I mean, it was, it was such a major disaster, but I spent a lot of time in Vietnam and people would, would ask me, you know, quite a bit about you know, what um, what life was like in New Orleans after after Katrina? I'm surprised at how many people knew about this um, pretty small um, Vietnamese community. You know, there there in, in New Orleans, it's small, but it's a it's a very significant you know and and, and symbolically important um, community. When the Vietnamese you know um, who came to America first started to come in um, April of, of 1975, New Orleans was was quite attractive you know to a lot of people in, in this first wave, you know, got a lot of the, you know, movers and shakers in South Vietnamese society, you know, the military, government, and business leaders, you know, were, you know kind of, were in, in the first wave out. 
and New Orleans was quite attractive because a lot of people in that first wave were, were Catholic and there's a big French influence, of course. And so, you know, we're the big Catholic French um, um, entity um, here, here in New Orleans. And then, you know, Catholic charities and other organizations, you know, um, made them feel, feel re really welcome. And so it's a, it's a small community, but it's also a, a very significant one and, and well known, you know, to people um, you know, back in Vietnam. So, yeah. Short, short answer to the question is yes. There, there was a lot of lot of interest in Vietnam about what was going on. And you can't anything to that because you were actually kind of involved in some of those um, um, TV um, TV coverage, you know, that the Vietnamese government did, um, you know, soon after. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's the government itself or the people, because you know a lot of the a lot of people in New Orleans still have family that are that are in Vietnam. So yes, so, so there, there are a lot of concerns, uh, vice versa. You know, if anything happened in Vietnam, people here are also very concerned and always, you know, trying to see what we can do to help. And that was the same thing, you know, when Katrina happened, that there were a lot of people in Vietnam trying to figure out, well, what, what can we do? You know, how can we help? And, you know, and, and so there is that concern. I'm not sure if it's come from the government. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say exactly the government, but yes, the people, the people in Vietnam were also were very concerned. Thank you, Cam and Dr. Van Landingham. So the next question comes from Ellen, Emma Willoughby, who's a PhD student in public health studying Vietnamese at the University of Michigan. I grew up in Ocean Springs, Mississippi, which also has a sizable Vietnamese community along with Biloxi. What is the history of those groups? Do you know if they came later influenced by this Versailles community in New Orleans? Thanks so much for this great event. Cam, do you know much about those two communities? I only know very little in terms of uh, Biloxi. Uh, Biloxi and, 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 uh, and New Orleans are very similar in terms of the weather. So there are some people, but, there, but I, I would say that the majority came from New Orleans first. And then when the fishing industry was kind of like overflowing because there's so many people doing fishing in New Orleans area, that a lot of them start moving to Mississippi. So there is a quite a, a, a large community in Biloxi, but I don't know very much about them as I, as with, compared to New Orleans. I don't know if, St. Mark, I, I, I don't know if you know more than that. So Carl, Carl, Carl Bankston has written um, extensively about the community out in Eastern New, New Orleans um, with his colleague Min Zhao. There's a, a, a classic, um, Book called Growing Up American that they published in, in the late um, 1990s. You know that also kind of talks about a lot of this this social glue and the reasons why this you know community is you know not just in Katrina but in a lot of ways has been a very successful one in, in spite of a lot of um, things working against him. He has a student, a recent doctoral student, who did her dissertation on the three communities in um, New Orleans. Biloxi, and then I think another another one in Alabama, but you know these Gulf Coast Vietnamese communities and the different ways that they um, reacted to um, the, the the challenge of C C Katrina. Her last name was V O, and I'll, I'll think of, I'll put I'll, I'll find I'll either think of or do you remember who, who it is? Cam, she was actually spent a little bit of time in, in in the School of Public Health. It's about more more than ten years ago, but I'll find it. I'll, I'll put it in the oh, chat. Is that is, is that T T V O? No. T H Y. Her, her last name was Vo, and she went she's teaching in a, in a college or university in Georgia. But, but I'll, I'll find it and put it in the chat. But I think you find it really interesting. She's written some really nice work about. Oh, oh you mean things. you mean V Dow? V Dow, yes. Yes, V Dow. Yes. Um, thank you. And then, yeah, Mark, if you wouldn't mind, just drop it in the chat. Your recommendation there. Um, we can move on to the next question from Leah King, who's an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. Is it possible or has it been demonstrated that this story of this community based on urban planning can be used in other communities? Of course, it shouldn't take a horrible crisis and neglect to permit such a community involvement, but potentially do we see this type of urban planning applicable to other communities or even specifically communities of color? I'll start off on that one if you don't mind, Cam, because I think you're, you're, you're too shy to kind of toot your own horn, but I think one, one, 
a part of that model would be take help where you can get it. So when you have other people who are kind of tangential to, to, to the community, not of New Orleans, but Vietnamese American like Cam, you know, who had some extended family ties in the area and really wanted to help, you know, and not, not just send food, but actually move, 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 move across the country from Colorado, you know, to bring, um, you know, kind of passion and expertise, you know, to the, you know, to the, to, to the fight to survive. You need, you need to be open to it. And VN was, is, it's also kind of fairly self um, um Deprecating and said that you know first he said oh, this is another outsider coming in to call, you know call, you know, call us stupid not with Cam but there's another young woman who kind of a community organizer I think from Seattle who also kind of offered their services and so you kind of have to be open in a small community you're not going to have this kind of level of expertise and it really is expertise about how do you do community mobilization to kind of fight a, a, a against something so if you've got folks who are kind of share some. Um, you know, some interest and in, 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 in some passion in the community, it's good to open, to welcome them with, with open arms because you're going to need all the help that, that you can get. I think if Father Bean was here, he would, he would agree with that. Uh, I, I think that's very good, Mark, the way you said it. Um, you know, I, I think it, it could work with other community as well, but I think it's, it, it all depends on the leader. You know, if you have a strong leader that can draw people together and envision the same plan, then I think it could work. I don't know, another another part of, of, of the answer too that was um, remembering some of Cam's remarks in her kind of her op her opening um, you know reaction to the film where she talked about the relationship between the older generation and the and the younger generation. That was problematic, you know. You know, as it is in all kind of uh, of a long-standing immigrant um, communities, the uh, first generation laments the fact that the youth are becoming, you know, less in this case Vietnamese, more and more Americanized, and so there's tension, you know, in there. And the a lot of the young people um, kind of um, rebel against the, you know, the, the hierarchical nature of. Of a, of, a, of a Vietnamese family, and they got other things to do. They don't necessarily want to want to learn the language, and so you kind of had this pulling away of the generations. That's natural and inevitable. But a lot of people had the uh, give Cam again a lot of a lot of credit for this, and and and, the, and and many others to realize there's an opportunity here. You know, to to um, encourage the younger generation who speak English better than we do, better than the older and the older generation to invest themselves in the community in a way that was really difficult for them to, to, you know, to do before. I mean, there, there were some other opportunities in, in, in Katrina when people were displaced and they kind of needed to, especially the English ability and the kind of um, knowledge of all things Americana that their kids had that, you know, they, that they didn't. But this landfill thing was a real opportunity for the older generation to kind of reach out and encourage the younger generation to really kind of invest their time and energy, you know, into uh, into a, a fight like this. Yeah, thank you, Mark and Cam. And I think actually what you're mentioning now dovetails really well into our next question. So our next question is comes from Christopher Lane from New Orleans, freelance artist and teacher. Howdy, Dr. Van Landingham. We are former colleagues from Tulane. I've spent the last us uh, a lot of the last three years living in Vietnam. One of the things that has struck me about the Vietnamese in Vietnam is both their compliance and disdain of their own government in Vietnam. Social dissent is crushed quickly by the government. Vietnamese speak foully of their own government, but comply. But here we have an experience in which Vietnamese Americans connect with the Asian, or, sorry, connect with the American experience of dissent and political activism. I wonder, do the panelists think about this social change in older Vietnamese living in New Orleans? What's the difference? What changed within them to believe that they could take things into their own hands? I think you started on that a little bit, but maybe we could elaborate more to answer Christopher's question. Mark, do you want to take that first? Uh, sure. Um, in the 
Um, <laughs> that's terrible, but Aurora gave me a nice plug in the in the um, um, in, 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 introduction. Actually, actually, it was Jessica in the introduction about the pretty recent book that I wrote called Weathering Katrina, which is about the Vietnamese community. And one of the things that I uh, um, um, focus on in the book is the adaptability. One of the reasons I'm trying to kind of explain why the Vietnamese did so well in the land with the landfill controversy, but also just in their general con um, um, uh, recovery at, after Katrina. One of the pieces of the argument that I make is that they're very adaptable. You know that um, when they come to the um, you know to, to, to the U.S., they do have this sense that you know government is not your friend. You know, and and, and neither are. are um, um, insurance or any other kinds of, of institutions, you know, it's a very kind of, I call it this kind of um, frame of insularity, you know, where they feel like, you know, it's us or nobody, we have to really, um, the, the cavalry is not going to come. And I think that they really distinguish the Vietnamese um, community from people like me, you know, who was really waiting for the cavalry to come. You know, after all that, I expected, I stupidly expected, you know, that uh, you know, my taxes were going to actually do something and my premiums to my insurance company were actually going to, you know, be, you know, be, be respected. Whereas my Vietnamese friends, you know, never, never dreamed that anybody was going to come and help, you know, that, that so they, they really had to kind of had to do it on their own. And so even though, you know, a similar um, protest, as Christopher, you know, rightly points out, you know, would, would be immediately crushed, you know, by the authorities, you know, in, in Vietnam, they realized, you know, that A, Calvary's not coming here, you know, we're going to have to, we're going to have to do it ourselves. And then B, this is America. We're not in Vietnam anymore. You know, since, and, and C, they had this ex outside expertise of these community organizers who kind of knew, 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 knew to kind of had to, had to advise them to go about this. And so all of those things kind of dovetail together to where it's a pretty cool protest. Thanks, Cam. Did you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I think one thing is that, you know, uh, the Vietnamese are always very self-efficient. You know, we, we uh, so in, in, in this case, you know, the, just like what Mark said is that, you know, the Vietnamese do not trust, trust government. They really don't depend on anybody. So in the, the, the older generation, we were able to persuade them because we just told them how this will affect the next generation, the, uh, of how it will affect the future, you know, the future generation. And I think that's was what that was just kind of, okay, well, if that's the case, then we're going to, you know, a lot of them say, you know, I don't care if it affects me. I could die because I'm old, I'm fine. But then, we, then when you're talk, talking about how it will affect their kids and their grandchildren, then that's when they start going, okay, this is important. I don't want this to happen. And so it was pretty easy to get them to come into the picture. And, also, and the things that, you know, they don't mind standing out, out in the sun. They don't mind protesting because they've gone through worse situation. So to them, it was okay. You know, and, and so the younger generation had an easier time persuading them because of that. Thank you, both of you. Very, very insightful. I, I think we have time to take one more question just because we want to be mindful of everybody's time. And I know for those of us in the East Coast here, we're approaching <laughs> my bedtime <laughs> maybe <laughs> soon. Uh, so, so this last question is from Cheryl Yin, PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Michigan. Do you have any information about the percentage of Vietnamese Americans who never returned to the area? Where did they move to? I visited New Orleans in 2010 and heard that the other New Orleans residents also left and never returned as well. Yeah, I've actually, uh, Cam, Cam, if you don't mind, this, this is something that I've um, been pretty focused on is rates of return to New Orleans from, from everybody, Blacks, Whites, um, Black, White, and Vietnamese are, are, are the three big ethnic groups. And it's a remarkable the proportion of Vietnamese who have returned compared to the more mainstream, uh, long-standing white and black black populations. And about eighty percent of the Vietnamese, um, you know, came 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 back, and and, and came back, um, you know, fairly quickly too. So um, um, that was one of the, the kind of when I'm kind of making this argument that they, they recovered more quickly and more thoroughly than, than other um, groups. That's one of the statistics that I, that I um, you know, draw upon is just how many of them came back compared to other sections of the city. Um, where they went, uh, you know, if, if they didn't come back, 
kind of all over, but not kind of all over the way the blacks and whites did. You know, they would, they would kind of go to Vietnamese um, cities with large Vietnamese concentration. Houston, by far, you know, the um, the kind of major that's, that's that's the major magnet. You know, where there's a lot of kin or fictive kin. Um, you know, of, of, of people people that, that they know, and a lot of the families here that are Vietnamese, but months and months and months, you know, kind of crowd, all crowded in the house of either a kind of a distant relative or not, or not a relative at all. And, you know, it seemed to kind of, you know, get, get along just fine. So Houston was the most, um, was, was, I'm sure, the, the lion's share. Wouldn't you agree, Cam? Yes, I would agree with that. I think uh, Houston got the most population. And then I think it would be uh, Dallas and then Austin and then Atlanta. Well, thank you for that. Um, thank you. I'm sorry we could not get to everyone's questions, but very insightful questions for the ones that answered. Um, so uh, I would just say, um, yeah, I thank you everybody for joining the webinar. I hope that this inspired you to learn uh, more about the Vietnamese community, especially after this documentary, just because uh, like the documentary demonstrated, for a long time our community stays quite quiet and flies under the radar. Um, but we really appreciate you joining tonight. I'm not sure, Laura or Jessica, do you have any closing remarks? Just a thank you to Professor Van Landingham and Cam Tran for coming and talking with us today because it really is, um, it's something I, a part of our history and our shared history as Americans. And, um, and again, thinking about how we can really be inclusive and think about all communities when environmental disasters strike. And it was a great movie and thank you for talking. And Aurora Lay, thank you for talking with us as well and having everybody here. And we hope to see you at more CEASE events if you are able, so please visit our website. Um, thank you very much. Oh, Cheryl and Mark, Cheryl says that she has a copy of your book. So buy Mark's book. <laughs> I have it, it's on my bookshelf. <laughs> waiting to be read. Sorry, but it's on the list. So thank you everybody so much.